All right, hey everybody, happy Friday, June 15th. Today is Friday, I'm very excited. Um, I'm here with my friend Tom, Tom Rebman. Wow, Todd, <laughs> obviously need help. Tom Rebman, um, who I have been dying to get on the show uh, since we started because his story I think is absolutely inspiring and amazing. Um, let us know you can hear us and see us. That's my biggest concern always. So if you can make sure you can hear, oh, Rob, Rob's on. Hey, Rob, can you hear us and see us? Let's just make sure, give me a thumbs up before I have Tom tell his entire story and then we have to re-record it. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a thumbs up. Let us know you can hear us or see us. Uh, hey, John, what's up? What's happening? Um, I guess we can go because nobody's giving me the thumbs down. So that's good. Awesome. awesome. All right. So you want first of all, let's talk a little bit. How did we meet? You know, Ted, I believe, did we meet? I don't even remember. Isn't did we that meet awful? here? We I met think here, we met here. I thought right? we met here at the Diamond Gala. That oh, I, that's exactly that, what we that did. If, yes. if my memory, you caught me off guard on that one. No, listen, I just thought about it now. I like to try to put, because I'm writing it down now as I get older. I write down when I meet somebody where I met them and why and like how the circumstances were. Um, but you're very, you're charismatic, caring. What a great guy. And I'm very happy to have you on. Well, thank you very much, Ted. I You're welcome. It. All right, so give us a little background on you. Uh, tell us a little bit about you and your, your humble beginnings. Well, uh, I went into the U.S. Navy at age 17. Thank you for your service. And did 23 years, retired as a naval officer, and uh, that was in 2001. And then I did a couple of things. I was uh, the CEO of a sports memorabilia company. And oh, I, I didn't know that. I was the vice president of an arena football team. You uh, were? The Daytona Thunder uh, in Daytona, Florida. Yeah, I, I did that gig short uh, for a short time and uh, one year. Wow. And so... Uh, then I went back to school because I knew that I didn't want to be in the corporate world anymore. I knew that I, I really just wanted to go teach kids. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I went back and got my degree at Stetson University. I got my bachelor's uh, in elementary education. And then I got my master's in teaching reading to impoverished children. And I've been a teacher ever since. There's a master's degree in that? Oh, absolutely. I have a master's in reading from Stetson, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. But to but impoverished children, why? What was the, what was the catalyst for you? Well, why, why children? Why young? children because elementary ed obviously is different than higher ed or uh, secondary school I'm sorry these young people don't even know what secondary <laughs> school is grammar <laughs> school god forbid um, but why younger kids well uh, elementary education was what I knew I wanted to do I wanted to teach children to read that that was really and the impoverished children is not actually part of my degree but that was my motivation for getting my degree in teaching reading Understood. And I've been in nothing but impoverished schools. I taught here at a 97% free and reduced lunch school here in Orlando. And um, that was kind of what inspired me into my new life here. Yeah, so let's talk about that because that's really the meat and potatoes. I mean, you've got lots of stories I'm sure you can tell about teaching. But somewhere along the lines, you had an epiphany or something touched your heart and you uh, got involved in the homelessness um, the homelessness crisis. So talk a little bit about what, what eventually got you, or what actually started it? What was the catalyst to get you involved? Well, the catalyst was, uh, as I was saying, I was teaching in Orlando, and I really, uh, these children had really worked hard. And it, the summer's coming up, and I know you know the United Way, and everybody talks about the summer slide, that if a child doesn't use his reading skills, his or her reading skills over the summer, they can lose months of growth. Right. So. This actually started not about homelessness at all, but just a way to keep my kids engaged. It was 2014 before Facebook Live and all that, and Facebook was new and hot. So I thought I would go homeless in downtown Orlando, not knowing what I was getting myself into. Just walk away with my ID card and, you know, yeah, show How do you come to that decision? How do you go, like, I want to make an impact. Why was that the decision? Why was that the route that you took? because I had to find a way to keep the children pay attention over the summer. Understand, a lot of these kids, we'd go do Saturday visits at their houses. My principal was awesome. And we would go and they wouldn't have windows in their trailer. So are these kids gonna read a book? No, but would they wanna see their teacher panhandling and staying in the shelter? In other words, it was a way for me to type things and get them to read over the summer was how it was initially intended. But what it turned into 
was something completely yeah, so different. Talk about amazing. that. So you spent how many days did you spend? Thirty days homeless, July fourth uh, to August fourth. All right, so that couldn't be any more of a hotter time in Central Florida. So when you made that decision, what were the things that you had to do? You obviously had to you had to think it through. I mean, you have to think it through. You you don't carry your ID at that point, right? So no. talk a little bit about the process <laughs> leading up to the very first night. Well, here's the thing. At the time, my wife uh, was in charge of all the food pantries in Central Florida for Second Harvest. So uh, her and I had a lot of experience going out and feeding the homeless camps. I literally had no idea what I was getting myself into and I intentionally did no research or did nothing except literally my wife and I went and watched the fireworks July 4th uh, at Lake Eola. I kissed her goodbye and walked away with the clothes on my back and my ID card. Wow. That's, and then I had no, of course I could have got her to tell me where all the resources were, but no, I wanted to pretend as authentically as I could and live homeless. In other words, the only thing that I didn't do, the real homeless person experiences, is I knew there was an end. Right. Uh, that's the hardest part is the mental torture of not knowing when you'll be secure again. So I didn't experience that part, but the rest of it, Boy, did I. So I, on that first yeah. night, what happens? So you say goodbye to your wife and you walk out into the darkness. And then did you already know where you were going to stay? Did you, ha did you have a backpack or a, a sleeping bag? Did you have anything at all? A pair of jeans, sneakers, the t-shirt on my back, and an ID card. And I, I literally, that's a good question because the first night I probably walked, well, I walked all the way down past uh, where the stadium is and uh, found this real impoverished neighborhood and there was a uh, park in there and the benches there seemed to be dark so I went back and slept on a literally on the top of a park bench uh, and, and, it, and from the time fireworks were over at 10 or so uh, till the time I got there it was miles so uh, it, I was ready to lay down and literally at 4 o'clock in the morning I woke up with a gentleman's hand in my pocket all right, so you got you got the real treatment right away. <laughs> immediately, I was immediately going, "Wow, what what kind of a decision did I make?" So, so yeah, so how do you you had to stick with it? So day one, like you're still kind of getting used to it. So even though you're probably tired and hot, you're still determined because you don't want to give up on day one. Exactly. Uh, but then, do you how do you maneuver through the resources that you didn't do research? Then you kind of have to figure out what. Our homeless population has to deal with where they go for a hot shower if they can or a hot meal how did that how did that first full day in the sunshine go for you well it was actually very easy because you know everybody knows that we have a lot of folks that are living homeless that congregate around Lake Eola that's exactly what I did is that on day two you know after that event and walking back to downtown because there's no resources in that other area right you know um, and so walking back here because I know that they have feedings downtown and I basically connected with the people that hang out at Lake Eola and within an hour I knew every day where there was a place to go eat whether it be under the bridge buy food or not bombs or in front of City Hall and the one behind the library and found out all this help system that's out there for these folks. So talk talk about the help system a little bit because so you're out there and then you realize all right these are the times do people bring are there certain groups that bring food out to the homeless population and then you figure out what times they are or how does that exactly work? well right behind the library um, there's a parking lot and one nonprofit every night feeds the homeless back there at 5 p.m. so 5 p.m. every oh. night five days a week or seven days a week and so like one of the groups is a group from UCF that comes out on Sunday and one group is a church and you know etc so that happens and there's also uh, feedings right in front of City Hall there by Food Not Bombs, and they also feed under the interstate um, over under um, 408. Wow. So, yes, there's lots of places to eat. The biggest problem is that it's just, it's completely unsafe and you never feel safe. That's well, let's talk about sleep and safety because obviously I'm, I'm not really, I don't even like camping. So imagine, I, I just, I can't even imagine First of all, being out in the brutal heat in the summer, having to deal with all the elements, the rainstorms in the afternoon. So you you find your food, you find your meal, and is it only in the evening, or did you have to find food 
uh, during the day? Did you have to find breakfast? Did you have to train yourself only to eat one meal a day? No, there's a church downtown that does breakfast on certain days, and then and then you know the feeding at City Hall is at lunchtime, and the meal behind the uh, library is every day. So at the minimum, you can have a dinner behind the library every day, and if you hoof it around enough, and that's another ho oh, oh, ho. I mean, you must have lost miles. so much weight, <laughs> Ted. I don't have a lot to lose, and I lost 28 pounds in 30 days. Wow. I look like Skeletor after 30 sure. days. And that plays with your psyche. So let's talk about sleep first, because sleep deprivation, it's got to be there, because you're, you're never going to get a great night's sleep, because aren't you on, you're on alert all the time. How does that work? So you have to find, is there a place for you to go sleep inside every night, or do you just have to find wherever you can park yourself? Well, both. Uh, I spent nights on the street, and I spent nights in all of the shelters that we have. And at this time, this was 2014, we had the Salvation Army um, that had a shelter. I stayed there. I stayed in the brand new Coalition for the Homeless Shelter um, and uh, stayed at the Mission. And so those were a few nights. But here's what people don't realize. You know, shelters charge you money to stay overnight when you're homeless. Wait, how? <laughs> all right, so how do you pay for how does that work? I did not know that. Well, so how does that not work? many people did. It works like this. You go to the Salvation Army, you get so many nights free in your lifetime, okay? And once you've used up, if I remember correctly, and boy, this, you know, I'm old, four years ago, but I think it was three free nights. And then every night after that was eight bucks. And how did I get the money? I would go panhandle at Orange and Central. All right, so, <laughs> so I didn't realize that. So, the, the sh so that's why the shelter is why the way that we have this shelter set up is so critical that we're revamped that because how are you, what if you can't panhandle? What if you don't panhandle? What if there's not enough money and you come up with $7 for the day, then you have to be out on the street instead of uh, having a place. And do they do that because there's just so much of a need and they're trying to weed people out? Or what's the rationale for charging somebody who has no credit cards, no bank account, uh, no place to live, money to stay. I'm asking truly, uh, there's no rhetorical question here. And and you know what? Uh, you know I'm an honest guy, so I have to give you an honest answer. I see no reason in the world they should do that. So I, I can't even justify why, and, and I would never want to say anything bad about the Salvation Army because I love what they do for the people that I serve, but I will say I have no idea why they would And charge. all three did? Um, well, no, the coalition is a program. So when you go in there, they allowed me to stay because of my campaign because they actually asked me to do like a secret shopper deal where none of their employees knew I wasn't really homeless and then I gave them a report when I left. And plus I was raising money during this campaign That's correct. for them. Right, right. So they wanted me to go in and so I got to stay there but both the Salvation Army and the mission at the time were charging. Cassie, Which were the two shelters you Cassie, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I'm glad you're not homeless anymore. I just, I find that fascinating because we we, we have iDignity I in town. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much, uh, if, if they can't get a job, I mean, there's, there's this, it's a vicious cycle is what it feels like. Mm -hmm. But if I had to figure out a way to pay for a place to stay, then I'm probably not that motivated because not everybody likes to panhandle. I, am, I imagine, or is that just a way of life? I'm asking all these questions totally naive, and if you guys want to give me a hard time later, that's fine. Or, but I don't know what that looks like. Well, well, let me tell you what it looks like. You know, you have to make choices. You know, like, uh, okay, let me give you another example that will make it really stand out. Okay, I needed to make money. I literally applied for 149 jobs in 30 days with my real resume, my, my degrees, my references. The only thing that was incorrect on the application is in the address block I wrote homeless. Oh, nice. I didn't know this either. Oh, yeah. Guess how many interviews I got? Zero? Zero. Wow. <laughs> so, and that's not because people don't like homeless people. I'm not going there. But if you're a guy with 20 applications, you're not going to pick the guy that has challenges to get to work. It's, just, it's that simple. No, so, I agree. From an economic, from a total business perspective, I exactly. understand that. Because, yeah, you're going to go, oh, my God, how, how are they going to get to work? What bus are they going to have to are they gonna smell? I mean, yeah, exactly. there's gotta, how are they gonna, how gonna, they gonna bathe? How are they yes. gonna, how is that gonna be? And what's their mental state? Because we have, we have some interesting preconceived notions, which I want you to share, about what the homeless population is. Is it all, is it all people who are mentally, uh, mentally ill, or they're all mental health issues? 
Um, and so I think people don't, um, they might be afraid of that on top of it. So yeah, if you've got 20 applications, you're gonna choose, you're not gonna choose that one. That's right, and, and so what I was saying was, I had to make money because I wanted to stay in the shelter and I actually got to stay in a hotel for two days during my homeless journey, a very cheap hotel, which I will not mention the name, uh, and that's $45 a night in downtown Orlando. So uh, you can imagine there's cigarette burns all over the place, there's bed bugs, it was horrid. But the point is, I took a bus all the way out to UCF and for those of you that don't know how far and how long of a trip that is on the bus, because that's where you can give plasma and I gave plasma during my homeless journey and got 50 bucks a pop so that I could feed myself and not have to eat. Well, I ate at the feedings quite a bit when I didn't have the money. And so I had the money to stay at the Salvation Army a few days. And that's what people really live under. And it's, when you talk about homelessness, let's talk about one thing, okay? When you see a panhandler, that's not the homeless. That's a panhandler, okay? 8%. I hope you heard that. 8% of the homeless panhandle. Remember, half of our homeless population is a single woman and a child in the state of Florida. Okay? That's a so sad So they're not panhandling. So when people hear homeless, the real sad part is when they hear homeless, they think of somebody panhandling instead of the reality. And the reality is I met rocket scientists. I met, I met NFL football players' brothers. Wow. I met Ronnie Lott's brother on the streets when I was homeless in LA. Wow. And, and so it can be anybody. And what it is, is with our mental health system the way it is, and once all the mental health facilities close down, jail, hospital, streets is the only way. And, and families can't take care of them because they have severe schizophrenia, they right. have uh, substance abuse issues and all that stuff. So the reality is the homeless people are just our population. And as a matter of fact, there's a heck of a lot more people, drug addicts and drunks that are housed than are homeless. So talk about that. I mean, that statistic about a uh, single woman and child is just sad to 49%. me. 49%. How did you become, uh, on the nights that you didn't stay or the stretches of time that you didn't stay, did you become one of the, like, I see a lot of homeless people carrying all of their belongings in like a backpack or a shopping cart. Did that become something you needed to do? And if not, what happens with them? Is it that they don't like to go into the shelters? Because uh, you obviously talked to everyone. It's not like you didn't have interaction. Um, do, they, do they not like to go in the shelters or do they just want to keep everything close? Well, it, it's numerous reasons for different people. Let me say this. Uh, you know, I hate to say this because uh, I'm a teacher, but I do smoke cigarettes. And um, when you go to the mission, when you walk in at 3 p.m., you can't smoke until they let you out the next morning. So if you're a smoker, do you want a Jones for a cigarette all night? That's one example. Gotcha. Um, some of the places that I stayed, because uh, we haven't shared this with everybody, but I ended up taking an entire year off teaching and going homeless for a whole year across the country. Um, but there's, there's places that are very punitive. People don't want to go somewhere and be yelled at and treated bad, so they're not even Why if would they, they be yelled at and treated bad? What's, some, what's going on in there? Is that, is that a power trip? Is it just indicative of the culture? I'd like to explain it, but I'd rather give you an example. Okay, Because I please. really can't. Okay, I went to a shelter in Jacksonville, and I won't name the shelter, and here's their check-in process. I got to the desk. And they said, here's your plastic bag. Strip down to your underwear. Everything you have on you put in this bag. They took me from there to the showers. After the shower, they put me in institutional clothing. They then took us to uh, a church service that we mandatorily had to attend. This is all in a group. Then they take us down uh, and feed us. Then they take us up, tell us it's time to go to bed. Or uh, time, time, yeah, time to go to bed. Wake us up at four in the morning. We take our institutional clothes off, put them back in the trash can, get our plastic bag, get dressed and leave. What do you think of that procedure? Wow, wow. Yet, yeah, who wants that? But I guess, I guess what happens is you don't know when you're going into it, but do, uh, there probably aren't a lot of people that go back unless that's what you want. Um, Jeff's got a question. Jeff, yeah. panhandlers in, in the downtown district is a large part of the reason I do not go there anymore. What can we do about panhandlers? 
Well, I'll tell you, the big secret that I have found uh, when it comes to panhandlers is what people don't realize is when we have all these people that are homeless on the streets that aren't the panhandlers, and we're not servicing that population, that creates an instant customer base for drug dealers, prostitution, and everything, and more panhandling. That's what it is. Right. And, and so basically, the real only way to combat panhandlers, because it is their free speech right to panhandle, but the way to combat them is to help the, the people that are homeless so that people recognize who they are and that there's not this instant customer base for the drug dealers and all the other things that are happening and that tends to dissipate. That's really the only thing I've found that's effective. So how did you, after 30 days, right? So I can't even imagine, I remember being sleep deprived as a new parent. Uh, that is enough, but I wasn't sleeping outside. I wasn't in the heat. I wasn't trying to figure out how to get the basic needs of shelter and food uh, at the time. So you're, you're not getting any sleep and you're in the heat and you're basically fighting for your life every day is what it sounds like to somebody like me. Uh, at the end of 30 days, what happens? So you, did, you do the first experiment, your first time 30 days out, you make it, which is so honorable and amazing that you made it through that. Um, what happens next? Well, um, on the 30th day I walked home and uh, my intent was to go back to teaching. Um, unfortunately, uh, I can't even begin to tell you what only 30 days uh, of homelessness did to me. Um, I was in the service for 23 years and I, I say this in, in speeches. Uh -huh. I would rather be in combat for two or three days than be homeless for a day. Wow. And, and the reason is that when you're in combat, the people that are with you, you are together. Right. Okay. And, and in the homeless community, people are in survival mode. So if the next guy needs your shoes while you're asleep, they're gone. Wow. Okay. I literally sat down with a guy and offered to share a public sandwich that was given to me. A lady went in and bought me a whole foot long sandwich. And I sat down with a guy to share it with him. And I turned my head to give him half and turned back and he took the whole sandwich. So that gives wow. you an idea, you know, and, and this wow. is another homeless guy. So I'll just simply say that, you know, it's, it, it's a real horrible environment. So after 30 days, um, I was a mess. But how could you not be? I mean, you because you made yourself completely vulnerable to it, right? So you set yourself up and you were gonna go through this no matter what. So how could you not be a mess? It's a completely opposite way of living that you'd never experienced before. So you, you did not go back to teaching. No, I didn't. I ended up, um, because the, it was so impactful on the community of Orlando. It really was. It taught people what homelessness was truly about. And that, that was very impactful. And if you add to that, we had just opened the uh, Coalition for the Homeless, brand new multi-million dollar state-of-the-art facility. And at the same time, Rethink Homelessness had that real super yeah. video that right. got national attention. It all happened like a perfect storm all in a one month period. Right. And so that, that changed our community. That taught me a lot, what, what it can do for fundraising and what it can do for um, getting solutions and getting political will and all of that. And, and so uh, I decided to do it again. So I went on a second campaign. I mean, wow. <laughs> I went on a second campaign uh, over around the state of Florida. And to make a long story short, I ended up being homeless in 13 cities across America. My last two weeks were spent on Skid Row in Los Angeles. Wow. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an experience. And I, I learned more about racism, politics, and all the other subjects than I really did about homelessness. Um, it was amazing seeing things from uh, an impoverished person's perspective. It was very enlightening. And so when you, you did that, 13, 13 cities? 13 cities. Um, so at some point though, that impacts your psyche, right? So you've, you've got to figure out, then you want to get back to your regular life where you want to make an impact based on, I mean, you're not going through this just because you are, um, you want to hurt yourself. You're right. going through this for the experience, but so that you can help the homeless population so you can be an advocate. So you you get through it, you're there, and then how do you take that? How do you take that experience 
uh, and make it into something where you are making an impact because you are and you have. But I think people um, probably think, oh my God, has he lost his mind? But that was such a when self- When I look back on it, I think that, Ted. I'm <laughs> well, not going to lie to you. I was winking I, at the yeah, audience yeah. on that. <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously, it, it gives you a perspective that nobody else has most of the time who's an advocate. I mean, certainly nobody has your perspective on it. So how do you take that and make it impactful to try to help the homeless, to have come up with solutions for homelessness? Well, let me tell you this. First, I, I'm, I'm not gonna mince any words. After 30 days of homelessness, I was a complete idiot. I mean, I literally thought I was thinking clear, I wasn't. I couldn't get along with my wife and we're best friends, you know, like, I mean, literally, I was a mess. So I made a whole lot of mistakes in the beginning, you know, because I'm angry. I'm seeing people that really need help and people aren't helping them. And I'll tell you, there was a lot of anger there. Sure. So in the beginning, the first year after I finished my homeless journey, I really um, made a lot of mistakes in trying to advocate for the homeless and got really upset because nothing could happen. I was impatient. I was everything. And so it's taken about three years for me to really, it probably took a good year after my year of homelessness to really feel normal again. But really it's just now that I'm getting back to the person I was before all these experiences. And so recently, um, you know, I'm working in the city of Palm Bay, Florida right now. And previous to that, I was working in the city of South Bend, Indiana. Every city, I learn more lessons on what I should do. And I think I'm getting pretty close to really understanding how we get extra political will, how we get extra fundraising, and how we do things without depending on government money, just through collaboration that changes our The community. collaboration's key, right? It's got to be part of the key. I, I feel like there are just, there's so many resources. That's why the, the um, commission trying to get all of the resources together. I understood the whole thought process of that because there was so much money being spent in one area and then we're missing out on 75% of what other people needed. Um, but what can we do? Like what can somebody like me who uh, wants to make an impact, wants to do something, see somebody on the side of the road, feels bad for them, but really wants to help and make an impact, what's the best way for us to get involved? Well, I'll say this. There were days I would go without using my voice or somebody acknowledging me. Wow. Days. Yeah. And, and, and so I don't know if you really realize what that does to you or when I'm out there and I'm asking for money at the corner of Orange and Central and a young lady walks by me and screams, get a job when I'm killing myself trying to. You, you, know, right. you know, it's kind of, you know, it's really demeaning. And so, you know, what you can do whether you give money to a homeless person or don't, look them in the eye, ask them how their day is. And, and here's the advice I give to everybody. You know, you, if your next door neighbor that just moved in came and knocked on your door and stuck their hand out and said, give me $5, you'd look at them and say, you're stupid. So why would you do that for somebody that's on the street? What they need more than a blanket, a meal, or anything else is a friend somebody to guide them through the help system because our help system, our nonprofit help system is broken and not because we don't have great nonprofits doing great things. Right. I'm saying it's very difficult for somebody in homelessness to know where the resources are and they don't have the ability to just run where they want to go. Correct. So it, that's why iDignity is so awesome, helping them get in their ID cards. I love that. I, loved, I love iDignity. So, but, but the thing is, is that our help system is broken. And so the big key is help people by helping their mental state, their psyche, you know, let them know that they matter. That's what, that's how you can help. Shelly, I love your comment. People are so negative towards appearances. I agree with you completely that you should just turn around and look them in the face and tell them to have a good day. I, I mean, can you imagine, like you said, that's very powerful what you said earlier. There were days that you didn't, ever, you didn't use your voice. So remember, you've seen those studies where if there's not human or interaction, if you're not having interaction with someone, um, that it is so bad for the psyche. So imagine you're already going through this and then nobody's even looking at you or they're looking past you. Uh, I can't even, I can't imagine um, the pain of that. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, I think people get afraid. You're afraid of the person. And do you buy them a meal or do you not buy them a meal? Do you skip the meal and do you just cut the check to one of the um, associations or one of the organizations in town? People don't really know what to do. We really don't. We know it's a problem, but we don't know how to funnel our efforts and our energies and our money into a solution. Well, here's the big thing. <laughs> here's all of my homeless knowledge wrapped up into one thing, the most important thing. If I didn't learn anything else from this beautiful city of Orlando, it's that getting the community to understand the problem is the number one way to have a solution. And when homelessness is in the forefront of the news, like Andre Bailey and, and those folks in Rethink Homelessness did, when you do that, it empowers people. Right. It, it brings more money to the table for the nonprofits that are serving the homeless. It brings people in that have great ideas that, that you haven't even thought of that right. make things work. And, that, and we see that all throughout the country. But the big key is everybody thinks awareness for the community is last. I tell that to every community I go into. There, you don't see commercials about homelessness on the TV all the time. How do you fix something if people don't know what the problem is and what the needs are? Correct. So they don't market homelessness. We, it's not something you know that, 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 that's sexy. It's not something that sells. Right. It's just true. Right. All right, any parting, there's so much more. We have to do another show. There's right. so much more to talk about, but we've run over, which I love, because I love your passion, and honestly, what you're doing, Tom, is absolutely amazing, and I appreciate all of it, and all of us do. Any parting words of wisdom, and I'll share all of Tom's information when we share the, uh, the show uh, later on. Any parting words of wisdom for them, anything you want to leave them with? Well, I'd like to leave everybody with this. Um, my mission is to raise the discussion level of homelessness. I will speak anywhere, anytime, free of charge, talk about empathy for the homeless, how we help the impoverished. So if you need that, look for my information at the bottom of the page. And Ted, thank you so much for inviting me on your show. You know, you know I just enjoy talking thank to you. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate all you do, really, I do. And thank you guys for the questions. Tom and I will respond to the ones that we didn't get a chance to on the show. Uh, we'll be back in a little while, but um, really, look him up. Watch, watch his Facebook page, we'll put all the links on there. Uh, get involved, get involved. All right, we love you guys.